now we are guaranteed that the presence of the Lord is with us right here, right now. Friends, uh, we are so, this week has gone so fast. Uh, Pastor McCain thought that it will run so fast. And, uh, you know, when we were planning together, I thought we would still be enjoying your presence here. And, you know, unfortunately, it's uh, the last day. And uh, I know uh, uh, Mamu Zoto will do the honors at the end of the program, but I personally want to thank you. You hit so hard this week that the devil had to come in onto this Zoom platform. Actually, the devil sent his agent, so many, to come and interrupt your message. And that was significant that God was here. God was here, my pastor. And uh, without any waste of time, I want to give over to you. Um, let God to talk to you, through you, my, my pastor. Let, let God talk to you, through you. And um, this is your time. Take over, pastor. Thank you, my elder. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And so today we conclude our seven-part sermonic study series from the life of King David. By no means has this been an exhaustive or extensive survey, but from this snippet, segment, and section of David's story, we've discovered things which have been significant and relevant to our own story and our own walk with God. In case you missed it, allow me to give you a quick review and overview from David's sin on Sunday, we saw the sinfulness of sin and the temptation to try to cover the crimes we have committed against God and others by carrying out even more sin. From David's shame on Monday, we learned that God can allow our offenses to be exposed, not to humiliate or embarrass us, but to wake us up from our stubbornness so that we can clearly comprehend that only God can take away and put away and do away with our sin. From David's supplication on Tuesday, we discovered the humility needed in asking God for forgiveness. That being sorry that we got caught in our sin or being sorry for the consequences of our sin is not enough. We need to see our sins as God sees our sins. Not just an accident, but an abomination. Not just a blunder, but blindness. Not just a defect but a disease, not just chance, but a choice, not just error, but enmity, not just fascination, but a fatality, not just infirmity, but iniquity, not luxury, but leprosy, not liberty, but lawlessness, not trifle, but tragedy, not just a mistake, but madness, and not just weakness, but willfulness. We need to see our sins as God sees our sins. And so from David's supplication, we are reminded that repentance, metanoia to my Greek scholars, is not just a change of mind, but it's a change in direction. That confession to God not only results in the right perception of God, but the right position with God. That sounds so good, it deserves to be said twice, that our confession to God not only results in the right perception of God, but the right position with God. And then we learn from David's silence on Wednesday, that silence is not always golden, that there are times where we must speak up and show up, that especially for those who have power, position, and influence, you need to be the voice of justice, righteousness, and encouragement for those who have been silenced, ignored, and abused. From David's song on Thursday, we saw that even in the valley of the shadow of death, God is with us. And then from David's son on Friday, we were reminded that indeed pride leads to destruction and arrogance to downfall. And today, on this set aside, sanctified Sabbath day, we come to the end of our journey. Today, we're going to talk, teach, and preach about David's seed. And David's soldiers had defeated Absalom's army, 
and it had resulted in the death of the crown prince. But even though victory was secured, David did not return to Jerusalem. David waited for the tribes of Israel to invite him back from the city of Mahanaim back to the city of Jerusalem, from past war to future peace, from being an exile and an outcast back to being on the throne. It was the tribe of Judah which was the first to recall David, and soon the king resumed his responsibilities over all the tribes of Israel. Peace was restored, and I wish that I could report to you that this was the end of the consequences of David's sin with Bathsheba, but don't you remember that when Nathan the prophet had confronted David about his sin, comparing his actions to a rich man, stealing from a poor man, his one and only little lamb, David himself had declared in 2 Samuel 12 verse 6, he must pay for that lamb four times over. David and Bathsheba's newly born baby was the first to die. Amnon, David's firstborn, was the second to die. Absalom, David's thirdborn and next in line to the throne was the third to die, but one more son of David must die. We're not yet at the end of our story, but we've come to the end of David's life. You've never seen David like this before. Hair white, body frail, but his mind is still sharp. He's 70 years old now, but don't be so quick to dismiss this old man. In fact, young people, don't be so quick to dismiss any elderly person. Don't be fooled by the fact that they walk a little slower, that they speak a little softer, that they hear a little harder. What they've been through, you haven't been through yet. Don't underrate those wrinkles. Don't underestimate that gray hair. For what you are witnessing is a wealth of experience, a fountain of wisdom, a living library. I know we live in a world of updates and upgrades, but don't dismiss our elderly folk. For oftentimes, they have forgotten more than our young people have so far learned. If only our younger people would listen to our older people, then you can learn from their mistakes and you can save yourself from slipping up and screwing up. You can save yourself from headaches and heartaches. You can save yourself from wasted time and unnecessary pain. And you can instead live a life which is fulfilling for you and pleasing to God. Can I give you a case study to support this thesis? Uh, just take a look at David's prophet. Not the prophet Nathan, who convicted David of his sin with Bathsheba, but the prophet Samuel, who anointed David with oil and set him on his way to fulfilling his destiny. David was a youngster. Samuel was an elder. But God used the older man to help instruct and direct the younger man. Are you not yet convinced of how God uses collectively, uh, cooperatively and collaboratively young people and old people? Let me give you another case study. How about Samuel himself when he was a boy? This youngster heard the voice of God not only once, not only twice, but three times, and yet he could not perceive who was talking to him. He needed elder, old man, high priest Eli, who realized and recognized that this was the voice of God. Samuel heard the voice, but Eli identified the voice. Young people, we need our old people. If an old person speaks with understanding, young person learn by listening. In the same breath, let me say to the elders of the church and the senior citizens in society, don't yourselves underestimate our young people. They have innovative ideas and enthusiastic energy and unparalleled bravery and an infectious passion. Nurture these qualities, mentor them, share your experience and be an influencer in their lives. We can't keep telling them that they are the future and that their time will come. We can't expect them to be always in class, never giving them the opportunity to graduate. So give them the keys. 
pass it on, give them the platform, adopt the three-step mentoring plan, whether it be at home, school, or church. Step one, I do, you watch. Step two, I do, you do. And step three, you do, I watch. And then watch them flourish. One young man who dismissed his old man was Adonijah. Adonijah was the fourth son of David. And so because Amnon was dead and Chiliab was not around and Absalom was dead, Adonijah assumed that he was next in line to the throne. He was the son of David's fifth wife, Haggith. But God had already revealed that David's son with Bathsheba would ascend the throne after David. Can you not see that despite David's sin with Bathsheba, in spite of the damages incurred by his disobedience, God can still bring something beautiful and promising out of the mess we give to him. So don't hide it. Let God have it. Yes, David and Bathsheba's unnamed baby died, but with God as the author of your story, he can turn your tragedy into fantasy, your horror into a thriller with a happy ending, and your memoirs into motivation to strengthen someone else. David and Bathsheba would have another child by the name of Shamua, and another child by the name of Shobab, and another child by the name of Nathan, which was not only the name of the prophet who had convicted David about his sin with Bathsheba in the past, but it would be the name chosen by the gospel writer Luke when recording the genealogy of Jesus in the future. Then after Nathan, it came David and Bathsheba's last son by the name of Jedidiah. You know Jedidiah better as Solomon. It was this son of David who was chosen by God to be the next king of Israel. Solomon, not Adonijah. Whilst Luke traces the coming Messiah's genealogy from David to Nathan, and then from Nathan all the way to Mary, who was the mother of Jesus. The Gospel writer Matthew documents the Messiah's genealogy from David to Solomon, and then from Solomon all the way to Joseph, who was the father of Jesus. If you would just pay particular attention to the names of David's sons with Bathsheba, there is a lesson to learn right there. For the name Shamua means one who listens to God. And the name Shobab means to return or to be restored. The name Nathan means gift. And the name Solomon means peace. Solomon's other name, Jedidiah, means beloved of Jehovah. I know you see the peace there is nothing that David could say to defend his actions this child dies and so this child remains unnamed but then if you would just listen to God and return to him you will be restored God will gift to you his peace reminding us that we are the beloved of God. Solomon was to be the next in line to the throne, but Adonijah had other plans. He dismissed, disobeyed, and disregarded the counsel of his father David and the command, will, and purpose of God. First Kings chapter 1 verse number 1 records, now King David was old and advanced in years, And although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. David is 70 years old, frail and fragile, for the years of being in battle have caught up with him and his time from fleeing from Saul and then his own son Absalom have taken its toll. But rather than being compassionate and considerate, Adonijah, his son, seeks to take advantage of his father's physical weakness. As the 70-year-old David lay on his sickbed, being aided and assisted by Abishag, who is a young Shunammite woman, brought to the palace to take care of the king, 1 Kings chapter 1 verse 5 informs us of what is happening outside of the palace. 
Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. Isn't this exactly what Absalom did? Verse 7 continues, and he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they, following Adonijah, helped him. Don't miss what is happening here. History is repeating itself. Adonijah, like Absalom before him, is David's oldest surviving son. And so he assumes he's next in line to the throne. And so the Bible notes that Adonijah, like Absalom, is a handsome man. And like Absalom, rides his horse-drawn chariot with 50 men running in front of him. For Adonijah, like Absalom, desires to be king. Adonijah, like Absalom, Absalom steals the support of those who had been close friends and long-serving counsellors to David. Adonijah, like Absalom, calls all the king's sons for a festive feast, and like Absalom, offers up a sacrifice to celebrate his kingship. But just like with Absalom's rebellion, word of Adonijah's activity reaches the palace. Adonijah may have Abiathar the priest and Joab the army general, but David has Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet. David may be down, but he's not yet out. Though he is limited and restricted to his sickbed, David acts with firmness and finality. He thinks clearly and he acts decisively. Check out his seven-step plan in verses 33, 34, and 35. Take your Lord's servants with you and set Solomon on my son, my, my son on my own mule. That's step number one. And take him down to Gihon. That's step number two. There have Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel. Uh, that's step number three. Blow the trumpet. That's step number four. And shout, long live King Solomon. That's step number five. Then you are to go with him. That's step number six. And he is to come and sit on my throne and reign in my place. I have appointed him ruler over Israel and Judah. That's the seventh and final step. As so of First Chronicles 23 verse 1 records, so when David was old and full of days, he made Solomon his son king over Israel. Israel. The fullness of years in this verse does not refer to the quantity of years, but quality of years. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. And so with David still alive, Solomon is crowned as king in his place. David had reigned over Israel for 40 years, seven years in Hebron and 30 years in Jerusalem. And at the age of 70, David died. But one more son of David must die. Don't you know that even in death, our actions live on? It could be a lasting memory or the impression that we left on someone, or the consequences of our actions. Adonijah had been like Absalom, but if we do not learn from history, we are doomed to repeat it. Adonijah used Absalom's same methodology, but he expected different results. Even after passing, after the passing of David and, and with Solomon on the throne, Adonijah desires uh, to marry Abishai. Just as Absalom had taken David's concubines to affirm his status as king, Adonijah now desires to act similarly, to show himself as king. But Solomon is a wise man and Adonijah is put to death. The fourfold penalty of David's sin has been paid in full. Justice has been served. Firstly, the unnamed infant. Secondly, Amnon. Thirdly, Absalom. Finally, Adonijah. Even though David is dead, we can still read and be inspired by his own reflections of his own life. Towards the end of his life, in Psalm 37 verse 25, David declared, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Can I talk about the most significant seed of David? Isaiah says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 
Luke records the angel's words to Mary in Luke 1 verse 32 this way, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So even though David's reign was temporary, Jesus will reign supremely and eternally. And even though David's sin brought death, Jesus' death brings us life. And so at the end of this seven-part sermonic series, if you're still fixated on David's sin, you've missed my point. All throughout David's life, when he had hardship, that's when he was closest to God, when he faced Goliath when he was running from Saul, when he was fleeing from Absalom, he depended wholeheartedly on God. But when he was comfortable, he became careless. He forgot that we still have an enemy that wants us to fall. But in Proverbs 24, verse 16, David's son, King Solomon says, for though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again, but the wicked are brought down by calamity. Whenever you fall, look up and get on up. The difference between a righteous man and a wicked man is that the righteous man gets up again. One bad chapter does not mean your story has to have a bad ending. From David's life, we learn that several bad chapters does not mean that we are useless or our lives are worthless or our future is hopeless or our plans are pointless. But you can let the author and the finisher of our faith, our faith write the rest of the chapters in your life. Yes, there'll be some twists and some turns. Yes, there'll be some ups and some downs. Yes, your encounter to some interesting characters which will require your patience, your love, and your prayers. But I can assure you that with King Jesus in his rightful place, there will be nothing but a happily ever after. If it's your desire to put Jesus first and foremost in your life, to include him in your plans and invite him into your heart, would you pray with me right now? We thank you, Father God, for the lessons that we have learned from the life of King David. But more than this, we thank you for Jesus, who is not only our perfect example, but our substitutionary sacrifice. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for patiently and persistently knocking on the door of our hearts. And we invite you in today and we invite you in to stay. May the comforts in our life never cause us to become complacent or conceited. And may the difficulties we have deepen and strengthen our faith in you. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To so the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say amen.